concocts a plot because it's already been clear that Boaz has been looking after Ruth and he is, he, he makes a comment about, um, he's commanded his men to not to touch her. Um, and just to clarify, because there, there were some questions around that too, that it, it does seem to hint at the kind of, um, the, the real vulnerability that women in Ruth's situation faced. Um, right. As, you know, a single woman, um, she's young, she's, she's out there with the men and things oftentimes do not turn out well for women in those situations, especially in um, the, in the ancient world, in today's world as well, right? She is, she is a, a target for particular types of violence. And there, there is this almost even a threat of sexual violence that kind of lingers over that comment. Um, and, and Boaz like is aware of that, that threat that kind of is, is always a part of her existence, commands his men to leave her alone, creates a, a um, a safe and, you know, um, space for her to do, to glean, to be able to, and, and then make sure not only that she's got some corners, but that there's a lot left over for her. Right. Um, now, Naomi sees this happening and realizes, okay, there's, there's a possibility here, right? Why, why else would he be leaving so much grain for her? Yes. So she commands Ruth to um, wash and perfume. This, this is verse, uh, chapter three, verse three, wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know that you're there until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and then he will tell you what to do. So wait till he's done eating and drinking, wait till he's asleep from drinking. He's passed out stone cold drunk. Yeah. Go cuddle up next to him. Right. Well, he wakes up and then see what happens. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that doesn't really fit with the Sunday school version um, because it seems to suggest that Ruth is, or Naomi is helping Ruth to create a situation that will, um, I don't know, help Boaz fall in love with Ruth even more. Like to create some sort of, of context for um, attraction, but even more than that, I mean, what exactly is Ruth trying to accomplish here? And I think this was coming through a lot in the student questions around, you know, what, do, what exactly do they do? Um, what, it, what are feet? Um, because it, it just feels dodgy, right? It feels really questionable. I guarantee you this is against like every single lifestyle covenant at every single CCCU school, right? You, I mean, number one, you're not supposed to drink, but you're definitely not supposed to uncover anyone's feet while they're drunk. And yeah, this, this is just not what's supposed to happen. So what do we do with this scene? What is, I mean, it fits in with Naomi as kind of the practical agent who just sees the lay of the land and's like, yep. Yeah, we need to get you a husband and this is how we're going to do it. Right. But it also feels very morally questionable. So what, what do we do with this scene and how do we unpack the kind of, um, I don't know, the narrative dynamics, but also the ethical dynamics of this. Right. So, I mean, you know, Tamar, who the text agrees with Judah is righteous, mm -hmm. also does things that seem outside of the, the boundaries. And it seems that the text may have, uh, you know, one sort of rules that apply to men in Israelite society, mm -hmm. right? All of the laws in the Torah, right, are addressed to you, a male householding, property owning, head of household, right, kind of, person or is about in the third person uh is about the stranger the the widow the orphan etc right um is about women and children but it's to right it's addressed to the laws are addressed to israelite males okay um so i think that there's uh that there's a an, you know, an acknowledgement mm -hmm. When you're talking about the ways in which uh, the ways in which women's operation of of what's right and what's just and what's just doable may you know there there may there may be an, a, a sort of expectation that yeah Naomi is Naomi has to be scrappy 
or has to be you know pragmatic because you know that's that's just that's just how things are and it may be you know uh, acceptable. I think there's another part of that which also then flips the script and versus the um, you know it, it, it plays all, I, I think this is one of the one of the reasons why people read Ruth as this sort of subversive text as this answer back to you know kind of Ezra's law and order kind of uh, you know exclusionism this is this is about taking all of that vulnerability and flipping it on its head um, the idea that um, a woman is acting with agency to take advantage right of a man who's incapacitated um, right is it it looks almost like an inversion right of what you know uh, what might be seen you know when you think of uh, like a date rape kind of thing. yeah yeah um, well, that, well that's hard to look at and to reconcile with there's also an incredible power difference between men and women and in a way that um, while it may appear to be a reversal it may actually be more of a leveling of yeah. because and, and another another aspect of that is this doesn't happen in the town this happens out in the field. this doesn't happen in the court which is where the next scene takes place the the, the, the gathering at the gate the public space where the community you know decides who belongs with whom but it it happens in a space where Ruth is able to have a little more uh, social, socially agency, right? She doesn't have a voice in the deliberation between Boaz and the other kinsmen and the elders at the gate, but yeah. she does have space to, to act at the threshing floor, outside of the city gate, mm -hmm. out in the, right, in, in the night, in the dark, when when the powers that deny her agency are somewhat mitigated right i don't know i i, I mean that's that's one one reading of it but I'm yeah, sort no, of no. yeah but no i think i think that's actually really helpful because we do get the sense that um i mean naomi and ruth both in, in their actions you get the sense that they're not um that i don't want to say sneaking around because that, because of the negative connotations that has but that they're not taking the most traditional path, right? But it's coming out of the out of a position of you know disempowerment, out of a position where that they don't have any other access to to Boaz, to the, the centers of power, to the sorts of legal proceedings um, that that would be the more legitimate or kind of traditional ways by which these sorts of things would be arranged. There is no father to go and speak to Boaz on Ruth's behalf and arrange a marriage or anything like that. They there's just no context for this and there's no context even for Ruth really to go and and speak to Boaz in any other way and so I think I think understanding that as um, that it's not so much of a flipping of the script to Ruth going in and entrapping um, a man who's intoxicated um, a sort of you know Potiphar's wife with Joseph that it's interesting that this actually aligns to the Judah Tamar story um, which is also a, a counter to the um, Joseph Potiphar's wife story right this um, area in which women with, with no power use what little power they have or what little agency they have to, you know, um, survive in a world that is really inhospitable toward them. And to um, find their way through a world that ought to have taken care of them differently but didn't. So I think that's the other thing we see in the Judah Tamar story that we also can kind of see at work here is Ruth and Naomi, to some extent, like, shouldn't be in the situation they're in. Like, this, it's not ideal. But also, there is another kinsman closer than Boaz who ought to have done something, we find out at the end of the story, but who hasn't. Right? Yeah. In both of these stories, we have a circumstance in which 
there actually were some sort of systems or structures in place that ought to have taken care of these women, Ruth and Naomi, and then flashing back to Judah and Tamar. And those systems didn't do their job. The people who were supposed to take care of them did not have that hesed for them that caused them to act and fulfill Torah. And in doing that, they not only lacked loving kindness, they also didn't fulfill Torah, right? So they kind of, we, we see how the, the lack of the one is also the lack of the other. And in so, that circumstance, women have to, ha, in, in, these, in these books, have to exercise what agency they have. Um, and that means risking a lot. And I think that's the other thing that, you know, it's easy to read this as, because it turns out happy in the end, as, as a great story. That's my beautiful dog. Everyone just got to see her nose. Um, they, but they risk a lot because this could very easily go the wrong way for Ruth. Just like for Tamar, things could have gone very, very badly. And so as much as, um, uh, yeah, I, th I think there's a way that this can, can be read as a flipping of the script that kind of feels problematic and like comical, but in a way that's actually not good. Um, that, that these actions are coming out of a place of desperation and a place of vulnerability and a place of great risk. Um, and in some ways, I mean, for Ruth to do this, I think that we have to think about the character of Boaz as well. Like what makes this even a possible risk to take? Because to be a woman discovered on the threshing floor like that, she could just as easily be branded a harlot and taken out and stoned, right? Like this, this could have gone very much the other direction as a story. Um, yeah. But there's something going on here that with Boaz's character as well that makes it seem like it might be a possible and viable way forward. And it's not just the fact maybe that he's left her all of this grain. Right. Whew. So hmm. I, I'm also thinking about this in terms of Lila. I mean, there's, there's the abandoned hut, right? The cabin that, mm -hmm. that becomes the place that, you know, it's a space that Lila can, can claim as her own. Mm -hmm. It's outside of town. It's, it's, sort of a, it's sort of a, in a way, kind of a metaphor, I think, for the, for the threshing floor. Yeah. It becomes the space in which, um, the space that is sort of left into which she can move. Yeah. And I think that's, I think, I think the social space into which Ruth can move um, you know, we read the biblical narratives and we read the biblical laws that are a tiny, 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 tiny fraction of the incredible richness and complexity and intricacy and ambiguity and contradiction of ancient Israelite life. Yeah. It's texts that are, you know, the laws that are addressed to particular, you know, land-holding Israelite males. Mm -hmm. um, the, the laws in the discussion of laws and all those things are, are, are about, you know, the people who are found in temples and courts mm -hmm. right? and around them. And we see that then as the, the public narrative, right? The, the narrative of the people we don't really know what goes on, right, in those spaces that are left to the rest of the people, including the stories of women who are right in, in Ruth's position, in Lila's position. So I think I'm I'm I may be seeing this uh, only to and I'm saying this only in, in saying I'm seeing it maybe a slight difference between Right, saying that they don't have anything, that Ruth doesn't have anything, but rather she and Naomi are making use of what the text or what the sort of social space that the text is interested in leaves to them. Right? right. There's a there's a whole lot of country outside of the town. There's a whole lot of field. Yeah. Right. Um, and I and in a way, you know. I think that there's, you know, there's certain things, right, that the, that the town folk will say about, right, that the, that the scribes writing the texts will say about everybody else in their society. Yeah. Even though they're mainly concerned about, you know, seeing their immediate circle as the ones who have the say and have the, 
um, who, who manage the resources on behalf of everybody else, right? But I don't, I, I, I think, I think the Ruth is really, you know, the Ruth and Naomi are, are not so much acting, I mean, yes, out of desperation in a way, but at the same time, very resourceful and not just resourceless. Right. And I think that's, I think that's one of the things that the text is really, I mean, that may be where the text is being more subversive, right, than the other, in other words, it's really saying, look at the resources that a Moabit, right, the, the Moabite woman has, right? Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting throughout the text, she's always flagged, Ruta Moabit, Ruta Moabit, Ruta Moabit, right? It, she, she never ceases not to, she, she never ceases to be the Moabite woman, right? right. And, that, and that's the thing that just, the text seems like just adamant to make, you know, to make clear. Yeah. So I think, I think she's really, um, you know, when we ask her what's going on and what is she doing in the field and what is she doing in covering Boaz's feet, all the rest of it, I think, I think maybe what we're, what we're asked to look at is like, what does the Moabite bring? Not what does the Moabite lack? Ah, so what, what do those on the margins maybe have to offer? What, what, what resources do they have that will maybe um, speak back to our positions of power in ways that we need, thinking about, again, the bigger context of this book. Right. That, what, what, do they, what does the Moabite have? She has chesed. Right. And it's her, it's her chesed that gives us a David. Right. right. And if, 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 we're in, if we're in a context, right, whether it's Ezra's context or whether it's later the rabbi's context, and there's, there is, you know, we're living under foreign rule and we don't know how to live as us, whoever us is. Um, you know, there's no, there's no way of, of having that kind of whatever we're imagining when we're imagining um, the, the Messianic kingdom, the return of, of the Davidic monarchy and sovereignty. Um, there's no way of having any of that without right and this is this is the subversive point mm -hmm. right without what the moabite brings right right i mean that's that's the challenge i think yeah both literally in terms of the davidic line and thematically in terms of hesed yeah that there there is no way to have that messianic kingdom that dreamed of eschatological vision in micah where every person under their own fig tree and under their own vine the lion lying down with the lamb, all those sorts of those, those you know, just Isaiah and Micah, none of that is possible without yeah. the literal Davidic line. Right. But I, I, to, to my mind as a reader, I think even more importantly, without, without the hesed that, that Ruth brings, that opens up this whole story, that makes it all possible in the first place, that can then lead, lead to the literal, right? right. That, yeah, and, and activates Boaz's chesed, because Boaz is a stand-in for, like, he's an ancestor of the Davidic kingdom. Right. So, like, you don't, you don't get the, the law enacted, and you don't, get a, you don't get a person to enact, to, to sort of be the symbolic guardian of the law being enacted, right? That's, that's a whole thing about it being set in the time of the judges, right? The book of Judges says, after Joshua, it all went to crap, right? And, it's, uh, and, and it, it, it ends with this terrible story, not just of you know, the people around, you know, oppress the Israelites and then judges will be raised up kind of spontaneously to, to free them. But it ends with this terrible, horrible story, again, at the uh, terrible expense of, of a woman who, uh, you know, this number of the, of the Levites concubine, and, um, and it creates a civil war among the tribes. And one of the tribes is almost lost. The tribe of Benjamin is almost lost. And so that, you know, echoes then the, is Saul the Benjaminite who does a who, who makes a similar uh, way of delivering the Israelites um, in the lead up to the story to David, but the book of Judges frames that last episode, beginning and end, with everyone did what they liked in those days because there was no king. So it makes the need for a king in the time of the judges, right? to make the law work the way the law is supposed to, so that Israel can work the way Israel is supposed to. Right. And the book of Ruth then comes in and says, okay, where did that happen? Mm -hmm. Boaz is the ancestor of that king. Boaz is the hope for 
all of that either to work the way it's supposed to or not. Mm -hmm. And Boaz's chesed doesn't get activated. The law itself, the chesed that eliminates the law, doesn't get activated right. without the Moabit, you know, the, the Moabit, right? Ruth, right. the Moabite, right. I, 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 think, I think that might be, a, that's a way of reading. Yeah, no, and, and I, really, I really like that because I think it, it really honors um, the role of the outsider yeah. in, in the story in a profound way. That, like none of this is possible for all the importance of all these, you know, these guys in power and their palaces and whatever. None of this is possible without the outsider, without the Moabite, without the woman whose who's Hesed activates everything else, whose loving kindness is like this necessary um, foundation for the entire rest of what's going to happen. Um, and I, there's something really honoring, I think, to, um, to Ruth, to her story, um, and to the, um, the gift and the resources that, that, that the outsider brings um, to the community and in the way that, that we've you know, positioned this book over this conversation. I think one of the things that has um, troubled a lot of the students in reading this, funny enough, is the goodness of it, right? That there's something kind of, um, especially coming out of, of in, the, in the class, we've looked at you know, the fall narratives in Genesis, we've read uh, kind of the, all the stories about um, Abram turned um, Abraham, we've read the Joshua narrative, we've read the David narrative from Bathsheba to the end of, of his reign. Um, so we've been wrestling with a lot of stories that involve very broken human beings, a lot of um, people in very vulnerable positions, a lot of kind of abuse and darkness and fallenness. And it's been a challenge, but also I think a real gift in the class to see where God has been active on behalf of those on the margins, those in vulnerable positions time and again in these stories. And that you know, God oftentimes doesn't intervene much but the patterns of where God does intervene are always on behalf of the vulnerable, those who are being taken advantage of, those who are being abused. Um, but the funny thing is then we get to Ruth and it's, it's such a good story. Like, yeah. uh, I, what do we do with this? I think was, was kind of the, like, we, we, don't, we almost don't trust Boaz, right? He's got to have an ulterior motive because how can he just be good? Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a, a similar, not so much a similar feeling with Ruth because we've gotten used to seeing the, a lot of the women being very much like Ruth and Naomi, you know, um, smart, resourceful, in vulnerable positions, but ultimately quite righteous in their, in the way they go about navigating these incredibly dangerous and tricky situations quite often. Um, but then uh, through this conversation, as we've talked about this, I think what, what starts to become clear is, um, that the goodness is real and that's maybe the way that that it's supposed to be and the necessary foundation for israel to be israel for the world to work the way god wants it to work and intends it to work is um is for this goodness this has said to underlie everything we do and the thing is though that will be countercultural. that will feel like kind of shocking and like we won't know what to do with it because it isn't the way that things tend to work um, but that's exactly the point, right? It, the way things are is not the way that they should be quite often. And so when they're put right, when we see people behaving according to Hesed, according to Torah, it will be kind of shocking. Like John Ames in Lila, right? Kind of this inexplicable goodness that is yeah. beautiful and compelling and desirable and shocking right like wait that can be the way the world is and ruth seems to say actually not only can that be the way the world can be but that's actually the way the world should be yeah and then the question in ruth you know where is god in all of this seems to be well he's he's everywhere in the people who are treating each other with hesed responding to each other with this deep loving kindness and awareness of the vulnerability and needs of the other. So, so where is God to be found in this story? Um, God is everywhere in the people, acting through the people as they are that divine compassion toward each other and modeling that divine compassion that God has for Israel through their interactions with each other. And, and that is, is beautiful and, um, and compelling, but also um, 
I, I think it is kind of deeply unsettling and shocking because we realize that that, that is what we want, but, but it's so foreign to us. And, and maybe that's part of the foreignness of the Moabite, right? That, that this is so foreign. Um, and that's exactly oh, right, it is yeah. foreign. That, that goodness is, is, is the thing we suspect because goodness is foreign to us. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful. Yeah. Well, I guess you remember when I first read Lila, you loaned me your yeah. copy, and, and I said I had a hard time believing that, that Robinson like, protects the character of Lila so much. Yeah. Um, and that there, you know, that, that, like, I didn't want her to suffer. I just had a, I just, I just had a hard time believing that, that she didn't, have worse hardship than she did, right? That, that her vulnerability hadn't been more exploited by the people around her. Um, and it's interesting recognizing that the same kind of question comes up in the students' questions, right, about, about Ruth, right? That there's, that there's a vision of, of goodness that, that doesn't shy away from vulnerability, that doesn't shy away from um, from the, you know, the immediate and embodied precarity yeah. of, um, of being in a situation where the one thing you know you do have is your choice to show chesed or not. Right. And there isn't anything else, right? <laughs> you know, Lila's devotion to the to the gravesite right is very much right the um you know even even the the, the picking and finding of, of flowers is, is a gleaning right, of, right. and often the gleaning to naomi um, yeah in a way that like you know there's something about naomi that that ruth is just i think she's just fascinated by it, right? Who, 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 is, who is this woman, right? Uh, it might, might, might be a, a question that, that Ruth has for Naomi. It's really interesting that who are you is the question that gets asked about Ruth. Yeah. Multiple times throughout the book, right? Boaz sees her, who is that? Yeah. Right? And, they, and they explain, uh, and so when Boaz talks to, to Ruth for the first time, he says, it's been told to me all the chesed that you have done for Naomi. Yeah. And when, when, right, when Ruth brings back stuff to Naomi, right, and Naomi's like, okay, who, whose field did you glean in today, right? She's really happy to learn, oh my goodness, Boaz. Right? We're, we're introduced, the reader's introduced to this beforehand, that Boaz is the relative of Naomi's husband. But um, we're, we, we have then the question that Boaz asks when Ruth comes to him in the, in the, in the field at night, well, who are you? Right. Um, it's really interesting, right, that, you know, on one level, right, it, it makes sense, right? It's nighttime and he's in a stupor. But at the same time, right, there's, there's that who are you that pops up again when, when Naomi asks, who are you, my daughter, right? Yeah. There's, there's this question of who she is that goes beyond simply like in the moment of the story, the, the identification of who she is from, from the other characters. But I think it really raises the question, right? Who, who is this, right? And mm -hmm. yeah. And she's 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 the one who's bringing who 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 identifies the goodness right that you're talking about this sort of unbelievable goodness or this unrecognizable goodness right who who are you and what you know what what is all of this goodness that she's that she is 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 bringing about um, in yeah. the story I don't know and and it seems that um, that your comment that like you know, the only agency that she that they have is the agency sometimes of, of, of Hesed, like to be able to show mercy to another. 
Um, and then that, that her constant choice to, to show mercy, to show loving kindness to those around her provokes this question, who are you? And it, and it does, it starts to take on these much deeper, I mean, we started this conversation about the question of who are you in terms of incorporation into Israel's identity, who gets to be in and out, this very sort of legal question of, of well, are, are you really a part of our community or not? Um, yeah. And through the course of this conversation, we've seen that, that question, who are you, start to take on this very deep, deep resonance of like, who are you? Who are you that you're able to show this sort of hesed to everyone around you? Who, who does that? Who's that good? Who is that compelling? Um, and it strikes me that that is an incredible testimony to, to Ruth as a human being and as a character, but that also, again, it is to be this model for what it is to be God's people, that our chesed for each other and for the world and for those on the margins and um, for those in our households, for, for the other, our, our chesed for the other ought to compel that question from the world around us. Who, who are you people, right? Yeah. Who are you people who constantly choose this, this deep compassion and loving kindness, this has said for, for, for the world around you. Um, and that it, it's funny to think that, you know, what, what does this have to teach us about Torah? I mean, it seems like it kind of has everything to teach us about the Torah, right? Ooh. In Ooh. terms of what it is to be a people who constantly provoke the question, who are you in that goodness that you, you constantly yeah. um, 